Hello, BookTube. It's Friday, and that means Friday reads. Oh, and for this video, I want to talk about a bunch of books that I will be reading, not half books that I have read and half books that I haven't read. These are all things that, I, that I'm that i going to be getting to this weekend uh, that I'm late getting to. These are all books I should have read already. Uh, the first one is uh, one of the only fiction titles in the list here. This is Tasha Alexander's uh, Uneasy Hangs, uh, what is it? Uneasy Lies the Crown. Uh, this is a, a Victorian murder mystery. In fact, it's as Victorian as Victorian gets because the, one of the heroes is given his commission by a dying Queen Victoria in the first pages of the book. Uh, I, I, uh, let me read you a little bit about it here. Uh, in this thrilling new mystery in Natasha Alexander's best-selling series, Lady Emily and her husband Colin must stop a serial killer whose sights may be set on the new king. Edward VII, my guy. Uh, on her deathbed, Queen Victoria asks to speak privately with the trusted agent of the crown, Colin Hargreaves, and slips him a letter with one last command. Uh, quote, uh, one and no more, dare to know. The year is 1901, and the death of Britain's longest reigning monarch has sent the entire British Empire into mourning. But for Lady Emily and her dashing husband, the grieving is cut short after the death takes the center stage. A body has been found in the Tower of London, posed to look like the murdered medieval king Henry VI. But when a second dead man turns up in London's exclusive Berkeley Square, his mutilator remains staged to evoke the violent demise of Edward II. It becomes evident that the mastermind behind the crimes plans to strike again, and naturally, if someone is posing dead bodies in, the, in postures reminiscent of dead kings, maybe they have their sights on killing the king himself. Uh, and I, I have read intermittently in this series and liked it, uh, and I, this is a, a lovely new finished copy. I just, uh, it's been sitting there and I haven't got to it. Terrible. Same thing with, uh, with this author. I've read, read and largely liked. I mean, it, it's popcorn stuff. It's airport fiction, but I, I've largely liked it. This is Robin Cook. His newest book is Pandemic. Uh, which is just what you might think. Uh, when an unidentified, seemingly healthy young woman collapses suddenly on the New York City subway and dies upon reaching the hospital, her case is an eerie reminder for veteran medical examiner Jack Stapleton of the 1918 flu epidemic. Uh, fearful of an, a repeat of the 100th anniversary of the nightmare contagion, Jack autopsies the woman within hours of her demise and discovers some striking anomalies. First, that she has had a heart transplant, and second, that against all odds, her DNA matches that of her transplanted heart. <laughs> uh, and then a couple more people die. And uh, that's, you know, the setting for a classic Robin Cook medical thriller. And I've liked enough of them so that I, I shouldn't have hesitated. And yet, I haven't got to this yet. So, so that that's, uh, needs to be done. I will be doing all of these. I'll be reading all of today, all of tonight, all of Saturday, all of Sunday, all of Saturday night, all of Sunday night, and most of Monday. Uh, that is the fiction portion of our flight. <laughs> then we have nonfiction to deal with here in nonfiction November. The first one, I don't remember if we saw this before or not. This is Bruce Ware Allen's History of the Tiber. Rome's classic, you know, Rome's synonymous river. And this this goes all throughout history. I, I haven't tried it yet. I don't know what to expect of it because I'm not sure I've ever read this author. Uh, I've mentioned on this channel before that micro histories like this, themed histories like this, tend to leave me cold. Usually, in order to stick to the to the theme, the writer has to cut corners, and I, you know, I see that coming a mile away, and I don't appreciate it. It always makes me wonder. Uh, it always makes me think, okay, well, this book isn't written for you, and then it makes me wonder, okay, who is this written for? Uh, but I could be wrong. I have sometimes been wrong, so we we will see. I, this is not a very big thing, so it would be an, be an, you know ninety minutes work to see what the author has to say on the subject of the River Tiber. Uh, then this next one is mighty strange. <laughs> It's a strange oddity. Only you could only get this kind of thing from a university press. And this is by Mary Hirschfeld, and it is Aquinas and the Market Toward a Humane Economy. And it is exactly what it sounds like. It's a, a, a marrying of the theology of St. Thomas Aquinas and uh, economics. Uh, Economists and theologians usually inhabit different intellectual worlds, to put it mildly. <laughs> yes. Economists investigate the workings of markets and tend to set ethical questions aside. Theologians, anxious to take up concerns raised by market outcomes, often dismiss 
economics and lose insights into the influence of markets uh, incentives on individual behavior. And Mary Hirschfeld, who was a professor of economics for 15 years before training as a theologian, seeks to bridge these two fields in this innovative work about economics and the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> I didn't see it coming. No idea what the author could possibly have to say on the subject. I can't wait. So, I, again, it's not a very long book, uh, so I will, be, I will be digging right in. Uh, and then this next one, I should have got to this a long time ago. I had the advanced copy, and I dipped a toe in here and a toe in there, but I never actually sat down and read it. Uh, and I, I still haven't. I've made inroads in it, and I keep putting it down. I keep getting distracted by other things. And this weekend, I mean to read it from start to finish and really bat batten down onto its... Uh, its sources and its bibliography. It's it's this. It's it's uh, Anna Beer's life of Sir Walter Raleigh, uh, which I have I have read enough of it to know all about it, but I haven't actually sat down and absorbed the whole thing, especially with the finished copy, which will have all of the the scholarly apparatus and the supporting notes and whatnot, so that I can go afield to my own library shelves and see what sorts of things the author is depending on. Uh, so I really need to, it's not, not so much, I have pretty much read this book, pretty much. Uh, I, now I need to study it. I really, now I have the finished copy, I really need to study this, and I will be doing that this weekend. It's not a very big thing, so it leads me to think uh, that it's going to be cursory a bit. Uh, which again, like the Tiber book, would probably mean that it's not for me. Uh, but I'm going to give it a try anyway, you never know. Uh, then these next two are fairly sizable. <laughs> they will take me some time. I haven't read either one of them, and I mean to. Uh, the first one, more of a duty than a pleasure, probably. I never miss a book on the pestiferous little Corsican, but I don't often uh, pat myself on the back for that decision. I often regret the fact that I don't miss a single book by him. This is by Susan Jacks, and it is The Caesar of Paris, the finished copy from Pegasus Books. This is about uh, Napoleon's delusions of grandeur, his delusions of being a Roman emperor, and the way he both reflected those delusions onto the city of Paris and the way he caused the city of Paris to reflect those delusions back to him. And I don't know, I don't know what to expect here. So, so it's, a, it's a fairly hefty uh, new study of, of Bonaparte, and I, so I can't ignore it. Even though this year has had its share of hefty studies of Bonaparte, I still have to read it. Uh, so we'll see. I, if if I like any part of it, even briefly, that will be good because <laughs> that's usually more than I can say about a Bonaparte book. Uh, but so I'll, I'll give it a try. Of course, it's a major book by a publisher I really like. So, uh, and then uh, also by Pegasus Books, even more major. <laughs> this is something we just saw on this channel. This is The Deadly Deep by Ian Ballantyne. This is a gigantic history of submarine warfare from the very beginning. Uh, you know with, where these things were flooding constantly, and crews were mostly in danger of drowning rather than, than taking on enemy fire, to the present day, where submarines roam the oceans armed with uh, nuclear missiles that could destroy all life on the surface of the planet, uh, and everything in between. And, and so I'm, I, I have had this, I have the advanced copy, I, I've had the finished copy for a while, I haven't dipped into it, and I intend to read the whole thing carefully and scrupulously <laughs> this weekend, especially, I mean, I'll read the whole thing. Yes, absolutely. Fascinating. But uh, I don't imagine that the author is going to be able to, to tell me much about the beginning days of submarine warfare, the monitor and whatnot, that I don't already know. And I'd be willing to bet money that the author is not going to tell me anything about the submarine warfare of World War II that I don't already know. It's the Cold War. That, that I'll be interested in seeing how this book deals with. There, there was uh, earlier in the year, or maybe it was last year, there was a book on Cold War submarine warfare that was really good, but it wasn't for a general audience. It was, it was uh, sort of dry and professional. Terrific subject. And those records are starting to become available to scholars, so the, it's, it's a burgeoning subject. I'll be interested to see. I'll read the whole thing with interest, but I'll be mostly paying attention to the, to the Cold War section here, because that's a long time where the boundaries between these two vying world powers, these two hostile nuclear powers, the, the vying boundaries between them during that long time were mostly naval. 
and a large percentage of that vying on the waters of took place below the waters was submarines. So uh, I think that's fascinating. I mean, I'll read the whole thing to see what the author has to say, but that will have my attention. Uh, so that is it. That is my uh, my Friday reads. No, nothing here that is stuff that I've already read. And stuff. I, instead, this is all stuff that I just need to get done uh, to get back up to some sort of speed with November and December books. Uh, so we have, we'll do a Steve pile here. We have The Deadly Deep. Then we have The Caesar of Paris, uh, Napoleon and Ancient Rome. Then uh, Traitor or Patriot, uh, Sir Walter Raleigh. Uh, then Aquinas and the Market. So Th St. Thomas Aquinas and Economics. <laughs> uh, then uh, History of the Tiber. Uh, no idea what to expect of this. If it's, a, if it's a potted kind of Wikipedia thing, I'll know very shortly. Uh, then Pandemic by Robin Cook, the latest medical thriller by Robin Cook. Uh, and the last one is Uneasy Lies the Crown, a Victorian murder mystery by Tasha Alexander, who does a terrific job. Her, her, uh, her mystery series have just no fat on them at all. So they are, they, I recommend them, even though I haven't read this one yet. I recommend the others. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that's going to do it for now. Uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.